Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, firstly, I, I'd just like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, of elders and past and present um, on, the, on which this meeting takes place. Um, and also, I'd like to thank the uh, AMRF for the invitation to present today. Um, we're so excited to see this development in Western Sydney. Um, it's going to become a key asset to help us uh, build our Australian sovereign manufacturing capabilities and also happens to be close to a couple of our facilities, which is uh, really quite handy as well. Um, look, technology has never been more exciting as it is today um, and never more needed in today's, radical, uh, in today's um, uh, environment of radical uncertainty. Uh, whether it's uh, manufacturing methods to support um, increased efficiencies to respond uh, to urgent needs for increasing capacity, such as um, you know, COVID and, uh, and also our defence, um, technical, technological advances in performance for our defence as well, um, or, or to deal with environmental changes. Uh, defence is certainly future casting forward to the technologies that will transform the, the battlefield of tomorrow. Um, 2030 in particular is, is a focus. Um, the increasing use of unmanned vehicles um, requiring battery te battery te new battery technologies for endurance and range, hybrid power technologies, um, new weapon systems, direct energy weapons, uh, hypersonic weapons, um, all of these requiring smart um, AI and intelligence in order to um, deal with the increasing complex complexity of battlefields. Um, potentially utilising things like quantum technologies. All of these technologies require new manufacturing capabilities and that's where centres like um, the AMRF with knowledge and facilities to support uh, engineers and technologists to develop and optimise processes to translate those from research into manufacturing um, and to develop the skills needed um, to implement those into industry will all contribute to us building a, and a strong Australian uh, sovereign manufacturing capability. Um, just a quick note on, on the image that's, that's shown uh, on our title page. Um, so this is by an Aboriginal artist called Ricky Slaven who works at one of our facilities, Lithgow Arms. Um, appropriately, it's called Creating Together, and it was sponsored uh, or commissioned by Tyler's and it appears across a number of our sites and on our vehicles, and it's really what Tyler's is about. Um, I'll give you a brief introduction to Tyler's, um, for those that are not so familiar, um, the global Tyler's and also Tyler's Australia. Then we'll just do a bit of a deep dive into a couple of the facilities that are based in New South Wales. Um, that are uh, um, our, our Lithgow Arms, small arms facility, and then Peter will talk about our under under um, water systems uh, acoustic centre of excellence. Um, so uh, Tyler's, uh, excuse me, oops, there we go. There we go. So um, Tyler serves customers with critical technology um, and systems that that they need to succeed. Uh, we work across five domains, aerospace, uh, space, defence, digital identity and security and transport and communications. Um, Digitisation is an increasing theme, um, even amongst our uh, businesses where we're traditionally using more mechanical, chemical technologies such as uh, say vehicles, weapon systems, explosive ordnance. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, that's, that, 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 that's becoming more and more, more important. So um, we invest uh, globally, um, we have uh, investment of uh, over a billion dollars a year um, in self-funded R&D and that's contribute, that's uh, consists of 28,000 engineers. So we have 85,000 employees globally. Uh, but 28,000 engineers and researchers working on those cutting edge, te cutting edge technologies. Um, so Tyler is able to reach back into those global research centres and transfer some of those technologies. <laughs> that's, just, that's very quick. <laughs> He's trying to hurry me up. Um, <laughs> Peter's trying to hurry me up. So, uh, so, um, so yeah. So that, that but that uh, we also um, have up a hundred million dollars uh, Australian dollars planned for investment in research over the next three years in in Australia alone. Um, this work is not done alone, though. It's done in collaboration with um, uh, universities and, and SMEs are a very close partner in innovation. 
Uh, also, uh, research organisations, we have with DS2G, Defence um, Science and Technology Group, CSRO, um, and also Defence Materials and Technology Centre, which you, you'll hear about some of that work to, uh, in, in the presentation today, the outputs of that work. Uh, so, TARS has um, a number of locations across uh, and a real history within Australia. So. Uh, our businesses, our Tiles Australia businesses, have for over 100 years um, helped government, armed forces and soldiers around the world master cutting-edge capabilities um, to help them protect communities they serve and make life better and keep us safer. Um, an extensive history um, of successfully delivering um, these sovereign capabilities um, the, uh, from designing and developing next generation protective vehicles, um, close combat weapon systems, um, to manufacturing guided uh, and unguided munitions. Um, the solutions, these solution, combat solutions are made um, to transform the cap capabilities of modern force, the modern forces, um, together with reducing uh, collateral damage, keeping soldiers safer and more mobile than ever. So. Utilising in particular lightweighting technologies is a, is a key element, and also digital, as we mentioned earlier. Um, Defence coined the the, ter the phrase well in their recent um, campaign for recruitment in talking about made in our backyard. So the value defence has recognised the value of sovereign capability for security of supply and the ability to respond quickly to surging demands. So manufacturing in Australia for defence is, is absolutely um, uh, paramount. Tala's also exports. So um, in a, we, we have uh, 3,800 uh, staff in Tala's in Australia, Tala's staff, but we create about the same again in, SA, in our supply chain. Um, they support not only um, the, the products um, being delivered in Australia, but also being e exported. Um, Mulwalla is one of our sites... Um, it has one of the, the uh, few facilities that's able to have a capability of producing TNT. Um, recently, uh, that uh, we've we've exported up to 100 tonnes in uh, in May 22 um, to the Philippines um, for use uh, by mining and infrastructure solution suppliers there. Um, that was working closely. We now um, used to source the toluene, a key, key ingredient from overseas. But now we work closely with um, Australian small medium enterprise Viva Energy um, to secure that local supply. So just one example of how we help other manufacturers within Australia to, to be able to access global markets. So Tyler's, uh, within Tyler's Australia, um, as we've mentioned, there's a, a significant chunk of our uh, our, uh, our, our um, spending is is on SMEs. So 82% of uh, our supply chain are SMEs, and 50% uh, of the spending for for our procurement spending was won by SMEs as well. Um, so a very important partner um, for 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 us. Yeah. So I'd like to so we'll I'll talk a little bit now about our. Uh, our Lithgo Arms Manufacturing. So, as you mentioned, I'm the um, I'm the techno techno te technology and engineering director for for our sm our integrated weapons and sensors business. Lithgo Arms is a is a key element of that. It's actually Lithgo Arms' uh, birthday today. We're 110, so <laughs> uh, we're all celebrating at Lithgo today. Um, I'll show, just show you a video of the some of our core capabilities there. It gives you a feel for the core capabilities that we have, have at Lithgo. Um, you'll notice there we've got testing ranges as well as manufacturing capabilities. Uh, one of the things that we have actually um, uh, launched just recently is a small arms collaborative cooperation centre to work with small, ma small and medium enterprises and, and, and other industry partners in order to build up that sovereign capability for, for small arms and in particular allowing things like access to some of the manufacturing but also the, the testing facilities and expertise that we have there. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side there's a, a slightly different <laughs> element to, to where we, we move forward with our, our small arms capabilities and that, that's where we're starting to look at the digital elements. So networking for collaborative combat, adding sensors for automatic detection and recognition, uh, health usage monitoring, as well as using advanced materials and light weighting for uh, thermal management and, and to maximise uh, mobility of the, um, of the soldier. 
Um, so a little bit about the history of LISCO arms um, and the evolution over those 110 years. Um, so the uh, one one thing that you'll you'll note there is that um, uh, the the lean manufacturing uh, it started in 2009, and, and that's really a key area um, that uh, we've matured as a leader in within Tyler's manufacturing group. Um, so we've seen an over almost 50% reduction in the standard hours required to, to build a military rifle. Um, and cumulatively, we've seen over the period from this 2009 today uh, a, a savings of over $20 million just uh, from that lean, lean activity. Um, the sort of lessons we learned through that, we, we focus or how we went about that, we've focused on the culture rather than the tools. Um, we've seen every problem as, a, a, as an opportunity to improve and use of visual management and transparency. So really structured pro problem, pro problem solving, so collaboration is key. Um, celebrating successes, so rewards and recognition, celebrating this, even the small successes. Um, and then a sort of why, why are we all here, establishing a true north and making sure we're all pulling in the same, same direction. Um, so I mentioned it's our, our birthday today, 110. Um, over that time, those 110 years, we've obviously supported two world wars and, and produced over one million, one million weapon systems uh, for, the, for Australian defence. Uh, so the, just, oops, a little bit more of the history. Um, we've, uh, the factory on the left there is our Building 52, or is a picture of a building very similar to our Building 52. A lot of the activities you saw in the video are actually in the still, still run in that building. Um, we are looking at moving now. We've got new facilities which are being built. Um, uh, we have a new building which is housing a, a new electroplating facility. Um, we're also looking at things like queen rooms for digital and optical electronics test and assembly. Uh, we have uh, we've had a really successful program with the um, University of uh, Deakin University around looking at uh, su um, manufacturing of um, or supply of in, in country supply of. Uh, carbon fiber and uh, an, an IMCRC grant um, and we've uh, you'll see in the next couple of slides we've been working with um, University of Queensland as well on uh, on translating that into to some products as well um, so we have new carbon fiber facilities um, and uh, we're also obviously looking with we have uh, some areas for metal, metal and, and composite ad additive which are expanding and we've also taken advantage just recently of uh, net 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 ends uh, training in that area as well. Uh, so this is just the history with the, uh, the, the forest of lever belts and as we were back in industry one. Um, obviously we've moved forward now, a lot of the machines are run with cobots um, and uh, that's an increasing feature within production. Um, and we've, as mentioned, we've been working with the universities on a number of research areas uh, so a very successful project with um, Defence Materials um, Technology Centre, uh, helping us with uh, liaise with universities like RMIT and University of Queensland on things like digital um, twins for our weapons, so modelling of our weapons for performance, uh, carbon bar barrel, fibre barrel manufacture, 3D printing, um, and in the future we're looking with AMRF to be looking at um, uh, some projects in those areas as well. Um, this is a little bit just showing a bit more about that work. Um, so going through the process and uh, um, of, of how we select the materials. So additive has really opened up the ability for us to be able to select almost any material, uh, whereas previously we may have just been using steels. Um, now we can choose the material and even mix the materials in, in the weapon systems as we build them. And finally, um, moving through to Industry 4 and Industry 5. So um, increasingly, we're looking at introducing digital threads, uh, a data flow through manufacturing. Uh, my background is semiconductor industry. Obviously, that's something that we, we've, we've done for a while. Um, the sort of different things that we're seeing coming in now is uh, the human being at the centre of that. So um, rather than it all being automated, that we're actually all, the humans involved and we're augmenting their view and helping them um, with uh, with um, ability to uh, to, to inc uh, inc increase control and information. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, um, 
I'm just going to give you a, a brief uh, look into one particular manufacturing uh, business that we have here in Sydney, in Rydalmere, um, and that's a, the Acoustic Centre of Excellence. Now, the Acoustic Centre of Excellence um, is, has been around for, since about the 1950s. It uh, originally started over at Metabank uh, in one of the very early uh, iterations of what was uh, eventually Talos Australia. Uh, and we're a part of the underwater systems business here in Australia. A couple of the products we got there, just out of interest, uh, the one on the on your right, uh, that's kind of called a mine avoidance and obs mine and obstacle avoidance radar. That's going to be fitted to the front of the Collins class submarine, giving them a new capability they don't currently have. Uh, they can avoid mines; they have other ways to do it. But this is a new capability for the for the submarine. And on the far right there, uh, far left, is um, a mine countermeasure. Uh, this will be towed through the ocean. It generates an awful lot of sound that's tuned to sound just like a particular type of uh, naval vessel. And uh, naval war stock mines are very intelligent. They can listen precisely for the kind of target they want to get. And hopefully this will simulate that target and then set it off. So the kind of uh, business that we're in in underwater systems, uh, we do everything from the sensor, which I'm going to talk about, our production capabilities, uh, on the outside of the vessels and products, uh, right through to the console that the, that the sonar operator is sitting at and the electronics and the software in between. This is typically the, the sort of uh, uh, market we're working in at the moment. Um, predominantly, this is the Australian uh, shape of the market, um, Anzac, whoop, we go back, uh, Anzac frigates, uh, that's a sonar miner, uh, mine hunter 2093, uh, we've got the new hunter program coming upon us that you would have no doubt heard about in, in the media, um, our Collins submarine, a new submarine at some point in time. Uh, MU-90 is the Warstock mine, uh, sorry, Warstock torpedo that the Australian Navy uses. We do the sensors in the head of that. And a, a rapidly growing and emerging space is autonomous uh, undersea mine warfare, anti-mine warfare. Um, now, we're providing sensors on, obviously not this platform, with this platform, but everything else, uh, both here and uh, also overseas. Now... That only represents 20% of what we do in Rydalmere. 80% of what we do is exported to other first-class navies around the world. Uh, we have a very close relationship with Talus France and Talus UK, which is predominantly where a lot of our product goes to, and then they are fitting out uh, multiple navies around the world. So a little bit about Acoustic Centre of Excellence specifically itself. Um, we are absolutely a, a unique capability here in Australia. There's, there's no one else like us. As I said, we've been around since about the 1950s, uh, specialising in piezoelectric ceramic. Now, some people in the room will know what that is and, and a few people may not. Uh, if you've lit a barbecue and you see that little spark, that's a piezoelectric material generating that spark. So piezoelectric ceramics are a multi-crystalline ceramic material made with lead, zirconium, titanium. Uh, and once we process it, it takes on a piezoelectric property, which is if we put power into it, it will distort and we can make it ping underwater. Or if it receives a sound signal, a sound wave through the water, it generates a voltage and we can hear that inside the sub. We can hear that signal. Um, so we've got a lot of specialist uh, experience in particularly in the design of uh, the sensors themselves and of the production processes. Um, but I, I guess uh, what, what I'm talking to you about today is, is we're a bit of a case study of uh, an established business having to modernise. And I've got a couple of examples of uh, a couple of processes that kind of bookend our manufacturing. And we need to do this to improve our competitiveness in, in the market space. That's legit. <laughs> That's legit. All right. I better get going. So the, the big driver for us is 80% is exported, but we're doubling our throughput and our growth is strong. Uh, 
a lot of money goes into R&D. We do a lot of SF R&D, and we're looking at the materials of the future, single crystals, which are used to seed uh, new uh, materials, and literally a single crystal. So um, this is... Um, these will be materials that are used on lighter weight products that are used on some of those autonomous underwater vessels where weight and battery power is critical. So just quickly looking at, uh, at our capabilities, uh, maybe a little hard to see there, but one thing you may pick up is they, they all look like they've been around since the 1950s, including this guy, and he has, and he's still with us. And these are the products we make. And... The driver for us is we are not competitive. Okay, uh, Australian Navy supply, Australian industry content, that's to our advantage. The export market, however, uh, there's no internal policy in Talis that says to France or the UK, you've got to buy from Australia. And we're competing against people who manufacture in Estonia. So an Estonian labour rate compared to an Australian labour rate, there's quite a differential. So we're currently halfway through a $10 million investment program to modernise our capabilities. And, and here's uh, the first of the examples. So uh, literally a, a real walk, workhorse. Uh, this is a disc grinder. All of our uh, ceramic products need to be ground to a, a high level of precision in terms of thickness and flatness. And this is a good old machine we've had going. You can see this is, this is lead. It's lead material, so it's, it's not a healthy material, and we've got a, we've got, you know, a bit of a HSE liability here, uh, and it is a fully manually operated machine. A guy is literally standing there indexing that down manually. We've modernised with its, uh, its younger brother, so now we're going to CNC, we're fully enclosed, we're better able to control the environment and, and the, uh, the lead runoff. But we've gone one step further to even higher degrees of automation and control. And this has just arrived in our factory um, from Switzerland. And look at this. It takes a cycle time from 90 minutes to 7 minutes, which is something we really need because we're going to produce over the next uh, two to three years uh, 250,000 pieces just for one customer. So... We really needed the capacity. But also what we got was this marvellous improvement in the quality, the, the uh, precision. It's just astounding. And a short video just to uh, hopefully give you an idea of what that looks like. So... Those of you familiar with um, disc grinders, you would normally have to set up the table with a vacuum jig or a magnetic jig or, or wax the parts down. That would take many minutes, a large part of that 90 minute cycle time. Uh, this is literally the training session uh, last week. So everyone was fascinated by that seven minutes versus 90 minutes. But when I heard about the accuracy we can now gain, the other thing I thought about was, can we start with a thinner block? Can we grind less? 250,000 pieces at a few microns thinner saves us a lot of, lot of material, a lot of processing time. We have to process all of that, that waste water through a, tr a waste treatment plant. So there's cost upon cost upon cost. And as well, the, um, the improvement in the accuracy of the machining um, will yield a benefit in terms of performance of the part itself. And that's even uh, as, a, as a, another way of giving us some advantage, some competitive advantage. It's given us an ability to negotiate with our customer around a performance aspect of the product that they weren't really too concerned about, but were able to demonstrate to them that gave them a better level of performance. And it meant we could trade off another parameter they were really interested in, but we were, we were challenged in meeting. But overall, the performance of the, the whole thing has improved. Now, it's going to improve again. So competitiveness isn't necessarily about cost alone. Uh, 
uh, and the second example is uh, this, this is a hydraulic press where all the parts have to be pressed to their rough green shape uh, as a very early part of the processing. And uh, we've replaced it with this fully automated uh, electric press. has an enormous amount of feedback in it. It is much smarter than me and, and most of the people who work where I work and we're, we're getting to the point now where we're allowing it to determine how it should run the press profile instead of us telling it what to do. Um, much higher pressing forces and uh, again I've got a little video of it here uh, during its commissioning phase and it's given us the ability to, again to produce uh, up to 2,000 parts a day. So. Um, Tremendous uh, leap forward in our capacity, but again, in terms of the control we have over the consistency and quality of the product, a real, real big leap forward. used to be longer, but then I realised there were parts you weren't allowed to see, so I've, I've cut it. <laughs> so, uh, and my closing slide. So, um, you know, I'm not trying to tell people how to suck eggs. This is kind of a 101 of the lessons learnt, and, and, and I think they're all obvious, but I think it's also important to remind uh, people who are, you know, investing in this modernisation or, or new startups, uh, some of the, the key things that we've learnt. So... The planning phase, I mean, uh, you know, we're investing a lot of money. Um, I'm, I'm not in the position of an SME where it's my money, thankfully. It's the company's money, so I'm not risking my family's home. But um, we are constantly reassessing our plans. Is it the right equipment? Uh, we did invest in a piece of equipment, which we then had to replicate when we realised, well, we only made it a possible to make one type of product. So we didn't think flexibly. Um, Uh, simple lower cost solution. So the great big blue press, $1.4 million. The, the double disc grinder, about $600,000. But the very first process in uh, making the ceramic is milling. And we could tell from the results at the end of the process which mill had been used because they were all over the place in, in the, the parameters we were measuring. $25,000 on new drives, new controllers. We cannot tell them apart now. So... And also we need that consistency to gain the benefit of what these machines offer. So we, we have to really think through the entire value stream. Uh, I just mentioned flexibility and future proof. Um, measure that ROI. As I said, it's not just through time and labour savings. There's other benefits that are embedded. And uh, first pass yield. We, we, we have to measure from day one, are we on the right track? A uh, particular problem for us has been in defence, of course, we're inside a, a pretty uh, bulletproof, pardon the pun, uh, firewall for our, our protection, but we need OEMs, they're European supplied equipment, we need them to gain access. So that's something that we had to work through. And, um, of course, then being overseas, we need to develop local SMEs to support those products. Um, Another issue around the uh, that caught us out, completely unawares, was uh, third-party software embedded inside the machine itself. One day it just wouldn't start. Turns out it's a licensing issue, and that's something we'd not, not foreseen. And I guess the thing, uh, it's easy to buy the, the equipment and reasonably easy to get it running. The, the hard part is developing the right people and hanging on to them. We all know what the employment market's like right now. Very difficult to find people, and when you get them, really hard to keep them. And, uh, of course, you've got new equipment, you've got new capabilities. Just don't reinvent the wheel and do things the same old way. Anyway, I hope I haven't run too much over time. Thank you.